Thanks for coming back. <laughs> and uh, as you just heard, uh, we have a, an R&D productivity challenge, it seems like, in the industry. And just to summarize very quickly, I mean, you read about that in a newspaper every day almost, uh, uh, but to, to summarize very quickly, we're not where we would like to be. But thankfully, uh, we have a panel of uh, experts today uh, who have worked very hard over the years, uh, over the decades, some of them, to really uh, get us uh, to where we want to be. And um, so I'd like to start by giving them a chance to uh, introduce themselves very quickly and give you a glimpse of some of the pretty extraordinary, extraordinary things that they've done. And then we will get into the question and answers. Melinda. Sure. Well, my name is Melinda Richter, and I have the unenviable act to follow my boss, Dr. <laughs> Paul Stockholz. Uh, so I am the global head of Johnson & Johnson Innovation J Labs. And at Johnson & Johnson Innovation, we believe, as you heard Paul say, that the best science and technology should become the best solutions for patients and consumers all over the world. And if we believe that, which we do, we also have to be humble enough to admit that the best science and technology is just as likely to come from outside the walls of a big company like J&J as inside. But when it's outside, it faces many more hurdles to becoming a viable commercial entity that can get solutions to the people who need them. So at Johnson & Johnson Innovation, our goal is to catalyze and accelerate innovation, support it to move forward to a, to a proof of concept, and along the way, figure out how we can partner together to move that closer to the patient. So at Johnson & Johnson Innovation, our goal is to support external entrepreneurs like you so that you can make a difference. I'm yeah. Jan, Jan van der Winkel. I'm a scientist by training. I uh, worked for anti on antibodies for over the last 30 years, uh, first with a company called Matarex, which is now BMS, uh, creating in the 90s uh, drugs like Gervoy and Obdivo, and then co-founding uh, Genmob. Uh, for the first 11 years, was the CSO of the company, and the last uh, eight years, the CEO of the company. Uh, we created two drugs, which are both on the market, which are doing very well. And we have a very, very uh, deep pipeline of next generation antibody uh, uh, therapeutics. Uh, I'm proud to say that we don't have a single traditional antibody in our pipeline anymore. It's all next generation, either by specifics or uh, supercharged uh, antibodies uh, with a new technology platform or combinations of antibodies and, and warheads, new types of chemo combined with, uh, with antibodies into uh, the new entities. So uh, we have, I think, a sensational pipeline and uh, we look forward to building an even uh, stronger company. It's now uh, Europe's uh, largest uh, biotech uh, company by market cap. And uh, we hope to uh, multiply that quite a bit over the coming years. Very good. David? I'm David Redfern. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of GlaxoSmithKline. Um, I've been at GSK actually 25 years. Um, uh, the strategy actually is incredibly clear. It's to develop innovative new medicines because as everyone's saying all day, uh, that's if you don't do that, you won't be successful. So you might ask what therefore the Chief Strategy Officer does um, if the strategy is clear. Essentially two things. Um, I chair Vive Healthcare, which Paul alluded to earlier, which is a joint venture we formed seven years ago to focus entirely on HIV end-to-end. -end, um, and that's been pretty successful and is quite a big part of GSK right now. Um, and I spend the rest of my time really on business development um, and corporate development and uh, all the alliances and um, deals and joint ventures that, that we create. Very good. Kelvin. I, so I'm Kelvin Stott. I am currently a portfolio management director at Novartis, uh, which is mainly about decision support in, in choosing investments in or choosing projects for investment within the drug development pipeline. But I guess that's only sort of semi-related to, to why I'm here today. Um, I mean, previously, I, I started out as a scientist, did my PhD at uh, Trinity College. So actually, that was very nice, a bit, bit of nostalgia to come back and eat at the, at the dining hall last night and catch up with lots of people I know from 20 year, years ago. Um, and since then, I've worked in many different areas from management consulting to venture capital, to my own biotech startup, to pharma, back pharma, uh, kind of strategy in pharma and, and back into uh, um, consulting and then back again into pharma. And, and, and one of the questions I was asked several times last night is, you know, which direction to go in? And one of the pieces of advice was, I, I don't think it really matters as long as you follow your passion. I think that's a theme that's come up time and time again. 
So actually all of these different changes and, and things I've done in my career have all been focused on a, a passion on innovation and, and the issue of R&D productivity, which is what does bring me here today. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to start with you, Melinda. And I think Melinda was a little shy uh, in introducing herself. Uh, she really oversees uh, uh, 130 uh, companies, uh, all of them populated with uh, mavericks and mad scientists. Uh, you know, people <laughs> who are every bit as passionate that. as you are about innovation uh, and uh, who uh, just, just will not let go. Every one of them are working on some uh, therapies uh, that are potentially game changing. Uh, this is what innovation is about. Uh, uh, how does it feel to oversee uh, such a population of uh, uh, very uh, independently minded? And <laughs> yes. Uh, well, actually, so to correct the number, it's actually 370 companies in total now. Um, <laughs> spanning 10 sites globally. We're about to open in New York City. We just recently opened in Belgium. We're about to open in Shanghai next year. And all of these people r represent to me not just inspiration, but these are, these are rock stars. And now, what's a rock star, right? Most of you are gonna think a rock star is a serial scientific entrepreneur who's been successful many, many times, and that's somebody else, that's not me, right? But actually, we're seeing a lot of these people be what you would consider ordinary Joes, who have an incredible passion for something, that have a talent and experience, a skill set that they're going to put to that passion and they're never going to give up. And those are the people who are making an incredible difference. Now, these companies, now we've ramped up a lot just in the last few months, but as of the end of last year, those companies raised $10 billion worth of capital. $10 billion, and hey, not all from us, from all sorts of companies, and we love that. If you get to the patient and if there's a better partner here for you, although at J&J, clearly, you don't have to wear a suit. Uh, <laughs> you guys look good, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then, hey, guess what? We all win because if we haven't been a patient, and if you're not a patient today, you will be in the future. So we want all of these companies to win. And when you come to J-Labs, it's a no strings attached model. So guess what? You get to keep your equity and your value and your freedom until you figure out if you want to partner with somebody so that you get to be that you know, multi-millionaire, billionaire who's going to go back and do it again and find other people to do it again. And that talent is here in this room. If you have the passion, which you're here, you've come from all over the world, you can do that. And we want to be a vehicle to help you, and it's not just for us, it's for the industry and it's for the patients. Um, so that's what drives me, right? I love seeing their passion. I love riding alongside of them. So 300 or so people, you know, innovators, uh, mavericks, uh, is one of the highest concentration of such people, I think, ever assembled in biomedical research. Yes, uh, it is actually, it is the no largest cohort of companies in any life science endeavor ever. Those people tend to be very strong-minded uh, and, you know, very independent. H how does it, how do they sit together? Do they work? I mean, uh, uh, what's the social relationship in that uh, environment? Um, so we foster this atmosphere of a community, a community that gives to each other. So actually, they get along really well with each other. Not only that, when you're in one of these environments together in one of our J labs, they all end up helping each other. So somebody who's an expert in, in one domain and is working on that will just pop over and say, hey, it looks like you're having a problem. And they're, you know, they're working on something completely different. And suddenly, you've got an expert who, in 15 minutes, can give you something you, you spend thousands of dollars on an expert. So it's incredible, that ecosystem. And, we have a very cross-disciplinary, cross-sector approach, right? So we have pharma, medical device, consumer, and health tech. And the beauty of that is, is you can now learn from other disciplines and think completely differently because you're inspired by other things. So, for example, I actually grew up in the tech industry, and I only got into this industry because I was a patient, and I was told I wasn't going to make it. And suddenly, I looked at the healthcare system in a very different way and inspired me to get into the business of health to change it because from what I saw, it was still so far behind compared to the tech industry. And so then I applied my tech lens to the industry and, and said, you know, if we look at this completely differently, maybe we can change this model 
and make it much more efficient, efficient and accessible and cost effective. And, and we did, and thankfully, you know, I was able to join a company like J&J &J with this model that believed in the impact and the outcome, not where I came from. And so your diversity of experience, no matter how you look at it, as long, again, as long as you're passionate about it, can make a real difference. Very good. Now, I'd like to turn it over to you, David. Uh, JSK has uh, been also very creative in coming up with uh, new research models uh, that would energize you know, the, the entrepreneurs within JSK. And I can tell you, you know, from following the, 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 the companies in the last uh, 15 years, that uh, what you did really resonated with a lot of scientists in the industry. Um, you know, they felt some kind of kinship with uh, this idea of uh, you know, being trusted to create something. Uh, how, uh, you know, within a big corporate setup, how has it worked uh, and, uh, and where is it going now? Yeah, well, I think what you're really referring to, Bernard, was a decision that was taken, I, I guess, around initially 2000 when GSK was created um, to really break down discovery into much smaller multifunctional groups, um, which initially were called SEDs and then evolved to discovery performance units, essentially based around an area of science um, largely actually indication agnostic, so working on a particular area of science, very uh, teams typically 40, 50 people, and what we did was we funded them for three years, and interestingly, they kind of self-selected over that time, and we felt that was the right model. Um, I think, you know, 15, 16 years on, it took a time to evolve, um, but we're pretty pleased where it's going. We've obviously just got a new head of R&D, how Baron, who's come in, but we feel pretty good about our discovery model, um, and we think there's great scientists, we've been able to attract great scientists, we've been able to, to go after great science. Um, I think, you know, some of the challenges, if anything, over the, certainly over the last five or six years, and I'm not a head of R&D, I have R&D in, in V, but I'm sort of more of an observer of, of, of GSK R&D, unlike Kamal and Paul. I think, it, it, I, I guess, the, some of the challenges we faced, if anything, we became too science dominated and we didn't get the voice of the patient, the voice of the payer, um, the clinicians um, really into the debate enough. And so that's one of the things we're looking at, um, which isn't easy because you need to have a multidisciplinary approach, but you also need accountability. Um, and we were, at times, that balance between what patients really want and where the science is going, we didn't get right. And I think the other thing, probably in hindsight, and it's been a theme throughout the day, there's no doubt to succeed today, you have to take big risks and big bets. And if anything, over the last few years, we've probably been a bit too diversified with too many programs, <coughs> trying to do too many things. Um, loads of passion, and it's always in big pharma hard to kill stuff every CEO and CFO in particular talks about it, but, but people have passion and killing programs is difficult. Um, and we probably ended up spending, spreading ourselves a bit too thin. So we're really trying to focus down, take some big bets and, and go forward. But, um, you know, all I'd say, I'm, I'm very excited. I think this is a great time for, for R&D. I think we're just on the cusp of a, the industry generally of a huge wave of innovation. So. I know this is about productivity gaps, but uh, I'm pretty optimistic uh, there won't be a gap. So if I compare the R&D spending of J&J &J with the R&D spending of uh, GSK, they're not too far away uh, from each other. Uh, she has hundreds of passionate mad scientists you know, working <laughs> for her. And uh, you've got some, but not nearly as many, and uh, you, seem to to, you seem to imply that perhaps it's a good thing. Uh, you know, it would be difficult to accommodate so many uh, you know, divergent scientists within a, a, a big organization. Is, is, that, uh, is that the... Uh... No, I'm not sure that's fair. We certainly have as many mad ones. I mean, it's... Um, uh, we, look, I mean, like all big pharma companies, we have now about 30 discovery uh, performance units, which is more of an internal effort, but 50% of our research is externalized in a whole range of different models, um, some of it through venture, um, some of it through some quite uh, innovative collaborations. We have a deal with Verily, which is the um, healthcare arm of, of Google, entirely focused around um, uh, biomedicine, so the idea you can use an electric 
bioengineering medicine, mm -hmm. you can use an electric pulse uh, to stimulate uh, a medical response. And the first indications of this are just about to go into man. It's progressing very well. Google and Verily bring the device, the device technology, the battery source, and that sort of thing. We bring the molecular biology, the clinical development. So um, we have plenty of uh, different collaborations and, and performance units, and uh, I suspect at the end of the day, there's probably just as much... Uh, Our own inner fire issue. Yes. Very good, very good. Kelvin, um, you have, as you described it, a, a very diverse uh, background, moving around pharma, around biotech, uh, and uh, uh, with uh, intermediate in, uh, uh, interludes in, in consulting, and you're also known for uh, voicing um, you know your 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 opinions, uh, uh, and uh, uh, when, when uh, I think I think that's a compliment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one of one of the things that you wrote about is that uh, you uh, didn't feel that the industry um, was perhaps uh, bold enough in uh, what they were doing, and uh, predicted that unless you were getting bolder, uh, uh, bad things might have you know m m might might happen. Uh, what you've heard from uh, Melinda and from David, is that bold enough for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Explain. It's, it's en route. It's in the right direction and mindset. But just, uh, I think it's important to, to really look at the numbers involved in order to get a sense of just how desperate the situation is. When you, when you look at R&D productivity in terms of the nominal value of, of what comes out of the process and the nominal value of the investment, bearing in mind there's a 13-year average investment in pe period between when you generally in invest over R&D to when the, the peak of your commercial returns, the, the ratio of the value of what you get out to the value of what you get in is, is 1.2 which means you get your investment back plus 20%, and that sounds great. But for the last 20 years at least, it's been declining by 10% a year. And that means within two years, we'll only just get our investment back after 13 years. And then, so by 2020, um, we'll be losing money in nominal terms. We're already losing money in uh, below cost of capital. It's that desperate. And actually, when you, when you calculate the impact of that on the, pro on the projected sales and P&L of the industry, it pretty much says that we're at the peak now. From now on, it's going to decline because that's already baked into the, the, the current return on investment that we're seeing across the industry. So we're going to see a decline. The question is, how much do we, difference do we need to make in R&D productivity in, in, to be able to shift that projection back up, even after a short period of pain? And actually, yesterday, one of the questions I asked is, you know, all this digital health, for example, what is the potential impact in terms of percentage on improving R&D productivity? And I think one of the highest numbers that came out was 80%. Well, let me just tell you, 80% is nowhere near enough. That will only slightly shift the rate of decline on the tail end of the industry. And the reason for that is because if your, your, if your return on investment is decreasing at 10%, each year, every year, you need to improve R&D productivity by 10% at least every year, year on year, just in order to keep from declining. But given it's already so low, we need to increase it by roughly 20% every year from now on in. And if you think what the industry has tried, all the technologies, combinatorial chemistry, molecular biology, genomics, blah, 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 we've been declining despite all of those breakthroughs. So that just gives you some idea of the amount of breakthrough that we really need. We've got to go not just bold, but kind of crazy bold. And, and I think it's also important to direct that boldness in a very focused manner. When you, when you look at the dynamics of the industry, you realize pretty much it follows the law of diminishing returns, almost mathematically perfect correlation. And that is defined when you've got a limited number of investment opportunities. If you're prioritizing those inv investment opportunities by return on investment, which we do, we want the biggest returns first, and we're left with lower returns later. By definition, your um, return on investment will follow a linear decline over time. But that only holds if you've got a limited number of investment opportunities. And you have to think, does that really apply to pharma? After all, we've got almost un unending unmet clinical need. We all die once, and we always will, at least once. 
um, uh, <laughs> according to, uh, uh, regardless of the medical progress we make. Uh, the calculated potential number of drug molecules that might be possible is more than the number of atoms in the solar system. There's an, an almost an unendable number of p possible drugs. So what is it that is really limiting, the ultimate limiting factor in R&D, uh, which, which is exhaustible and in, now in very short supply? And as it turns out, it's the number of, uh, of viable new drug targets. There are 20,000 genes in the genome. About three quarters of those have no link, no known link to disease. Maybe they are masked by parallel, compensated by parallel pathways, or maybe they are uh, even lethal before birth, but certainly not directly linked with disease. And of the remaining kind of 5,000, there's a big proportion that we've already exploited, about 700 targets. There's a big proportion that we've tested and have failed, i.e. have no um, positive outcome. Uh, and there's a big proportion of what's left that will never be commercially viable. Simply the address has been, uh, the, the needs have been met by addressing other targets in a, in a related pathway. Bottom line is we're probably on around 50 to 100 possible viable remaining drug targets. And once you exploit each drug target with a drug, you raise the, each new drug raises the bar for the next one, makes it more difficult to uh, success rates go down, makes it more difficult to exceed what is already the standard of care, and the, the potential uh, benefit, benefits get more and more incremental. So I think in terms of bold, we've got to think not just in terms of what's a new uh, drug or a new indication, we've got to completely think outside the current model and get away from the limitation based on drug targets. And here we're talking about cell and gene therapies and potentially also new modalities that can actually get into cells and inhibit protein-protein interactions, which small molecules can't, can't uh, do because they're too small to bind uh, and compete energetically with flat interactions. Meanwhile, big proteins usually just can't get into cells. So we need, we need very big, bold new ideas, new ways of addressing complex biology which is way beyond where we are with small molecules and therapeutic proteins today. So in a sense, the work that is being done with uh, you know, digital therapies and some of the crazy things that uh, is going on uh, would seem to uh, supplement or to help relieve the shortages. Of I target. think they're supplementary. I think they're important uh, changes that are desperately needed to be able to um, tailor medicine to individuals and so on. But in terms of solving the underlying problem and the diminishing returns, I, I don't think it will ultimately help. It will produce a, a kind of period of relief, um, assuming we can even implement all, the, all of those benefits. And they're important to, to still continue following. But just to put things in perspective, we, we need something much, much bolder. Well, let's get a little bit of an external perspective. Jan, you've been uh, looking at this industry and from the outside uh, and uh, working with it quite successfully mm -hmm. as a supplier of uh, breakthrough molecules, antibodies. Uh, and uh, uh, as you, know, you look at this changing environment uh, uh, in the last 20 years, uh, um, you must have observed things that really struck you as being very, very smart and others as being perhaps not so smart, uh, you know, things that the industry did uh, or that led to problems. Uh, can you give us kind of the outsider's uh, assessment of uh, uh, the industry's performance in the last uh, uh, 20 years, uh, you know, in a very quick, uh, and also where do you see it going? Thanks for this interesting question. I could go on for the, for the next 36 minutes, I think, <laughs> on, on this one. But let me give you a few uh, perspectives. I think we need a new system. Um, GenMop is a company which has been unusually successful by all means. I mean, we filed 28 INDs, so 13 drugs still in development, two are on the market. One of them has the potential to become the biggest cancer drug, I think, ever developed over the last uh, 20 years or so. So I think we have a very good track uh, record. And we have 16 partnerships, six uh, pharmas, and 10 biotechs. And I will not give the names, uh, because some of them are in the room, actually, here. Uh, of these partnerships, and, uh, and uh, we see differences between the different uh, partners. I think uh, the model is too much focused right now on, on numbers. We have also heard that in this discussion. It's not about the numbers, it's about the quality of the drugs. I think there have been a, 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 manically, a manic focus, I think, on, on numbers. 
But it's all about differentiated drugs. I think uh, you can better, I keep saying in the company, I can better create every three years a Darcelex than, uh, than every year a, a Me Too or, or incrementally better uh, drug because it doesn't say anything. Mm -hmm. I think there's too much focus now on repetition. I have trouble seeing, and it came up earlier today during this very interesting symposium, uh, there's now 50 PD-1s or PD-L1 antibodies in development. That doesn't make any sense to me because uh, they are not going to be all different from uh, one another. Uh, probably they, uh, there are probably one or two really, really good ones, and the rest is just incrementally better or the same, basically. So it doesn't, doesn't make any sense to me to spend any energy on that. So I think what we need is a, be a better focus on differentiated drugs. Um, and the, the question is how to do that most optimally. What I see here, what we heard in Kamal's uh, lecture and uh, what we hear uh, uh, from Melinda, I think it's a much better system to actually work in a new ecosystem where actually the pharma that's what it's doing really, really well. And that is these, what I call, large military uh, trials, like they do, J&J is doing for Darcy, like 75 studies, 12 phase threes, 11 half thousand patients. There's no way that we as a biotech company could ever even manage okay. even, even one third or one fourth of those uh, studies. And that is being, that is needed when you have a truly differentiated drug and you want to maximize the potential and the impact on patients because it's already benefiting, I think, 30,000 new patients or so now, and that number will keep uh, growing. So I think what we need is we need to, the farmers to focus on what they're really, really good at, and the small, nimble biotechs, maybe the, the, the rock stars or the, uh, the young entrepreneurs, they need to focus on good science and then actually uh, and, uh, transforming that good science in very, very good differentiated drugs mm -hmm. and then need to be connected to this bigger ecosystem. So I think we need a new model, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that, uh, I don't think that the current uh, uh, pharma uh, model is sustainable, actually. I think we need a, a completely new model where it is more a network. And, and I was very pleased to hear that this network idea was coming out straight from I've never heard it before from Bayer, but I heard it from Kamal uh, today, and we all have heard it. I think that makes complete sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, work together with different uh, uh, groups who are top, uh, which is with, with, uh, focus on top science, get inspired by nature, that's how we work. We only do antibodies, and we only do cancer. And we focus on actually on getting the making the best antibodies thinkable against different targets. And then you can even use the old boring targets by combining them with new targets, because 85% of our pipeline is by specifics. It's combining new combinations with, with very hot uh, science, which we developed in the company, or use new ways to supercharge antibodies to become like 100-fold more potent than normal antibodies. That are the type of drugs you really need in the future. And then we need, I think, pharma and big biotech uh, uh, partners to really develop them uh, optimally. So it's, it's, I think it's a different model, and I think industry needs that, otherwise it will not be sustainable. Mm. Well, well, can I just double yeah. down on something, though, which is I hear all the, the numbers, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important to recognize, but it comes down to patient impact, right? Yeah. So where are there still large areas of patient needs that we yeah. don't have good enough yeah. drugs for? And that's where you come in, right? So this whole idea of a distributed network it's about kind of giving up control, right? Exactly. So changing our definition of talent. It used to be that talent was defined as anybody who you know, has the title FTE, full-time employee, on their forehead. But really, talent should be defined as anybody who's on the same mission we're on, right? Mm -hmm. You just may choose to show up because of your personality and life circumstances as an employee. And listen, that's a high bar to get into being an employee to these companies. But you may choose to because of your personality and life circumstances the, prefer the boomer or bus cycle of an entrepreneur, and that's great. You're part of our talent strategy, right? We need to serve you and have this immense global decentralized network of people who are out there, no matter where you are, focusing on the best ideas that could have a massive impact for patients. And if we can serve both of those groups of people, in fact, put them together, right, because mm -hmm. they're complementary. You know, the entrepreneurs are out there going, crazy on new ideas, whereas the people within a large company have had the experience and wisdom, the process and the infrastructure to take it to the patient. Exactly. So that's where the power comes, when we leverage the potential of each player. Can I add, sure. add something? I, I completely agree with that. And I also think what we miss here in this discussion is academics. I think, I think this is really a triangle between biotech entrepreneurs, uh, academics and, and big pharma or big biotech uh, players uh, doing the military uh, mili uh, execution of clinical development and maybe sales, although 
I think that sales will also need to be different in the future. I think we need a completely different sales uh, model. We already heard the problems with PBMs earlier today in the discussions. I mean, honestly, we need to leave that whole uh, I agree. model. I agree. And I think uh, we need also to adapt a new way of thinking about uh, creating new differentiated medicines. We need to be willing to share. I mean, the old-fashioned model of paying a poor academic uh, group uh, $3 million and promise them 3% royalty in 12 years, that is not really mm -hmm. fair. Mm -hmm. To make a long story short, for the breakthrough innovation, can be even, can even be a Nobel Prize uh, winning innovation. I mean, we need to be, wi think, be willing to really truly share like 50-50s, uh, even with those uh, groups. And then society need to uh, figure out a way to pay for, for the 50%, of course, once, uh, because drug development is actually quite costly. But I think we need completely new thinking to actually create in a more effective way a novel concepts which are in a very differentiated way making an impact on, on, on patients because that's what it is all about. Mm -hmm. so there's another side to what you said. I mean, yeah. you said you brought 19 IND. Uh, you know, to 28 INDs. 28. And 13 are still in active clinical development with us, all okay. our companies. And you have 250 employees. Yes. So that's a remarkable level of productivity. Th that is unbeatable up to now. Yeah. So is it the new model that you're, you know, claiming uh, for? I mean, uh, is is that basically what you? Uh, yeah, we, we you really want to stay uh, stay small uh, because I think that is actually very, very uh, conducive to do this uh, this very, very uh, innovative uh, work. I mean, we just uh, st uh, entered a brand new R&D center, and and basically it's all about connection, getting in contact with other uh, groups, and, and getting inspired by, by other others, whether it's a surgeon from the, from, the, from the hospital, the university hospital, which is just on the other side of the street, or uh, researchers from other institutions that we all want to bring them into contact and actually get, develop these ideas together and be willing to share and build new models. I mean, we have a number of what I call 50-50 models now built up with uh, biotechs, like BioNTech is a good example. It's a 750 person uh, uh, private company in Mainz in Germany. They are phenomenal. It's one of the best companies I've ever uh, run into. And we actually share ownership of drugs uh, with them 50-50, which is a completely novel idea. Later on, they copied that because they did exactly the same deal with Genentech for, for personalized uh, cancer vaccines. Uh, but they and also they kept on 50% of the ownership. And so Genentech said, fine, and they dumped in $300 million up front just to, uh, to make that work uh, uh, going. So I think we need new ways of thinking, uh, and the same with academics. So what you're saying is that yeah. it's not really how big you are because you only have 250 oh, yeah. people. We want to stay it's not how much money you spend because you know, you cannot afford to spend that much being yeah. you know, a fairly small sized company. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's some more about cross-pollination. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And yes, the company is very uh, profitable. I mean, we are profitable for five years, which is quite unusual for a biotech company. I don't want to ex discourage any students, but it takes on average <laughs> 20 years between founding the company and making it sustainably profitable in biotech. And, and the, the, I think one of the best examples ever, Genetic took 22 years, actually, be, between their found foundation and becoming sustainably profitable. And that's one of the best biotechs. Uh, it's an iconic company, which we all, uh, we all know. And it took us 13 years to become profitable, but then the first five years was profitability based on milestone income, and that is not sustainable because you either get it or you, or you miss it. And many times, uh, you, it's the partner deciding whether they go forward with the program or not, so you don't have any control over that. But as of last year, we're sustainably profitable, and that means that you're profitable based on royalty income, which should go up and up and up when you have a good drug, basically, and then you can keep on investing in the, in the years to come. But we want to stay actually very, very small, because I think this is actually a better model than to try to expand the company into a company with thousands of employees. Yeah. Uh, research is not that scalable, I think. I think uh, some of the panel members here may have experienced that. The, when you have a very good productivity with 100 scientists in a small company, then you, when you multiply that by 100, that doesn't mean that you get 100 times more drugs, basically, out of that uh, unit. The answer is no. Maybe, uh, Bernard, uh, I mean, Jen Mabinyan have achieved amazing things, but before uh, Jen, Jay Novartis, and GSK leave here and break, it, break ourselves up into <laughs> hundreds of Gen Mabs uh, mm -hmm. to be small and nimble, maybe I'd try and just make the case a little bit for Big Pharma. Um, Absolutely, I don't think anyone disagrees that at the research end, the more creative, the more open, the more collaborative with all the different models, and JLabs is, is, is clearly very effective and so forth. Um, 
is the way to go, and I think the industry is learning that. We all do it slightly differently, but flexibility. We do a lot of crowdsourcing, actually, of quite a lot of our research stuff, and we get an amazing response. Mm. But development is a completely different beast. You need scale, you need efficiency, you need to measure it by the minute, by the hour, you need a regulatory organization that can deal with mm -hmm. 150 countries around the world. Um, and there's a huge difference between research and development. The second thing, which I think we're only, which is probably the fundamental reason why I'm very optimistic that this, I mean, your future may come through, but I'm, I'm more optimistic than that, which is, uh, I think we've had, obviously, Bill Hasseltine here and George Post and so forth, and clearly fantastic work done 15, 20 years ago by them on genomics and, and that whole industry, but it didn't really lead to a great wave of new medicines. It led to some, but, mm. but just having the genotyping in itself wasn't enough. And at that time, the industry and the ecosystem didn't have the capability to properly link genotypes through to phenotypes and make all the necessary connectivities to come back to really identify the complexity of the targeting. I do think that opportunity now really exists, and it's, it's complex, and it needs a combination of fantastic molecular biology, machine learning, artificial intelligence, clinical development, and medical knowledge to come together to really make those links. And then I think we get a big increase in targets and productivities. And someone has to be in the middle to do all that. It will need all sorts of collaborative approaches, but it will need a catalyst in the middle to bring it together. And I think we're right on the edge of being able to do it. And you know, whether it's GSK, Novartis, j and I'm sure it'll be a combination of us all. But I do think that will lead to a huge increase in productivity. And then the second thing is there's clearly very exciting new technologies. I think we are only just at the start of really understanding the benefits of immune system modulation, and clearly all the work at the moment is around cancer and probably first line, second line lung cancer, but there may well be, I mean, there's clearly benefit uh, in other disease areas, in autoimmune, probably even in things like HIV, and I think we're only just starting that. So I'm actually pretty optimistic, and I think Big Pharma will have a big role in it notwithstanding the great, <laughs> great, work great. small companies do. One, one, one final question to all of you before we turn it uh, over to, to the room. What, what you're saying basically is that you have to have an apparatus to run clinical research, which is by necessity pretty ponderous. It's heavy, you know, it's big infrastructure. I mean, you need that capability the know, to do you know, real serious clinical research. Uh, uh, so you've got, you know, as long as you need that, that, that infrastructure, uh, it's best filled up with compounds that are of the highest quality that's possible. Uh, and uh, the question then becomes, uh, can you source those compounds from within, or can you source them from, you know, should you source them from the outside? Or I even heard or hear more and more ideas such as the future of the pharmaceutical industry is in a crowdsourced discovery system. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, first of all, I'd just like to say I, I am still pretty optimistic because we've got the leaders. <laughs> we got the leaders of tomorrow here to solve all these problems, right? And hopefully, some of these talks will inspire you even more to be, uh, you know, to tackle these problems head on. I, I think regarding where we get the innovation from, I don't think there's really any clear need to differentiate between internal versus external. I think you have to look at all options equally. The challenge internally, of course, is on the development side, yes, you need a lean, efficient, focused infrastructure to really test the hypothesis in an efficient way. Once something has come out of the lab, you need to be efficient and test the hypothesis. On the R side, as opposed to D, it's a very different culture. You're in exploratory mode. And I think this is part of the problem in pharma is, is you have this dichotomy or bipolar personality where you have a very startup focused kind of entrepreneurial exploratory, let's say right brained mindset in research. Whereas development, as you move into that mode, you have to be much more exploitative, focused on an end objective and answering the key questions. And they're two very different cultures. And to have those coexist together in one company, especially if the company has kind of top down cultural values and processes that, that constrain those together, it creates some very uh, unwanted side effects. I think size of a group is very important. Mm -hmm. um, 
having small kind of entrepreneurial teams and communities working together is critical. And I think that was the idea behind the DPUs, mm -hmm. um, the idea behind incubating companies. You need these kind of micro environments. And I think sometimes what companies do is, is they make the mistake of acquiring an outside company for its innovation. And, the, and they miss the obvious, which is the value is not in the asset or the innovation itself. It's in the culture that created it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And often what happens, they acquire companies and then their culture kind of consumes it like a kind of macrophage and it's <laughs> all that talent is suffocated, neither moves out or falls into line, but it just kills creativity and innovation. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've got to create innovation and freedom to be diverse and, and aim high and fail cheap, learn fast. And it's all about culture at yeah. the end of the day. And that's the only way you're going to get the, the comp a, a, any company, big or small, to fo focus on trying big new ideas and breaking new ground. Yeah, it's certainly the way we think about it. It's better to keep the companies on the outside as long as possible. J and J do a fantastic job of yeah, leaving stuff leaving alone. Leaving it on the outside and yeah. then only needing to bring it inside when it's absolutely the best thing to do for, for the product at that stage. Uh, but support it, right? Yeah. So treat it like it is part of your talent, right? What kind of resources do you need to help push it forward? Because we all win if they do. Um, but that is a very different um, strategy, right? Everybody always asks us, like, why are you doing this? Like, they're so suspicious about mm -hmm. why we would give a lot of these resources, which we do right from the beginning in a no-strings-attached way. But listen, if they're successful, we're all successful. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just changing our mindset about how you can do this. You There's know? a fascinating debate that mm -hmm. the corporate center has at GSK, which I sit in is part of, which is how rational do you want to be with R&D? So we spend $6 billion a year. So on the one hand, you could just give that to the head of R&D and lock the CFO in a cupboard. Um, uh, and lots of people advocate for that and not let anyone from the center then interfere at all. Or you can have very complex portfolio committees where every decision is made on an MPV basis and lots of financial analysis. And it's extremely rational. Um, and it's a very difficult debate because you can't be at either end of the spectrum, but you have to be somewhere in the middle because you can't be totally irrational. We have yeah. shareholders and so forth. But judging where to be, um, you know, when to keep everyone out and just go with the gut and the passion and when to be a little more thoughtful around it is, is extremely delicate and very, very hard to get right and probably one of the most single cultural things that, that we have to do. It's also something we do in portfolio management. Yes, on one side we run the calculations and run the numbers and make sure, you know, do some financial analysis. But actually that's a very left-brained approach as, uh, again. So it's important, you know, to take a, a, a more qualitative look, look at things like strategy, corporate social responsibility, things you just can't put on a spreadsheet. And to be able to form a holistic view of, of opportunities in terms of their impact and risks and are those risk worth taking and so on, to, to be able to form a holistic picture. Otherwise, if we were just either thinking left or right brain, we, don't, we wouldn't have both yeah. through evolution would be walking. Exactly. I think we got caught a little bit in that trap doing EMPV when really we should be talking about what's the patient journey. Yeah. And uh, from the time they're healthy to, you know, they're getting sick and how could we prevent that? What's the diagnosis? What's the therapies? What's their experience in the hospital? And now plot all these different technologies that we have outside and inside along that patient journey and then compare and contrast them and which is really going to make an impact compared to what the standard mm -hmm. of care is today. And I think that's a very different way of doing it than saying NPV, right? Because the EMPV doesn't speak to, to mm. how you feel about it's it. It's important, yeah. but it's part of the sure. overall, you, you know, you've got to make sure you're making some return or and, uh, at yeah. least on most of your projects. I mean, mm -hmm. it's fine to have a few philanthropic things and I think every company should but uh, at least to be aware of what the financial implications are, but on top, especially keeping these ide the, the strategy at the strategic level, focusing on transformative medicines, being first in class, innovative, and things. 
again, you, you lose that if you do a detailed financial yeah, analysis. Yeah, uh, I think that's, that's pretty clear. Picture. I think we, there's a consensus there that uh, it's all about the culture, and I exactly. think we agree with that. Everything. And uh, I also agree with uh, the, uh, you know, your point uh, and uh, echoed by uh, other uh, panelists uh, that uh, there's a danger, you know, we're focusing on NPVs, which, by the way, I consider as a calculation of very old value on my, you know, my own point of view. Mm -hmm. But I think the greater danger is that we may lose sight of the importance of, you know, the drug that, that we heard earlier. Okay. It has to make a difference uh, to patients. It has to make a big difference. It has to change something. Uh, it has to change ideally the standard of care because, uh, you know, that's what innovation is about. Uh, it's not about marginal thing. So, uh, and by over-focusing on the process of, you know, all those calculations, the, the big spreadsheet and all that, we, we, we tend to lose totally sight of, uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, patient aspect of it, uh, uh, and and end up developing drugs that uh, we shouldn't be developing. And actually, one of exactly. the sorry. Yeah. So some some I think some pharma companies uh, I've seen they're more run like uh, government institutes, and and that's not entirely positive. I think. Uh, so that's when your efficient. observation of uh, as exactly, an outsider. Exactly, and and that I think that needs to stop because that doesn't make any sense to me, uh, and and they focus too little on the quality of the drugs also. So for you, all of you there, there's the, uh, the quick uh, rule, of, uh, rule of thumb. Uh, if it looks like a government institute, uh, <laughs> probably not the place to go. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, uh, I would like to turn it over to uh, the, the room. Uh, who's got questions? Thank you for making the time for us. I'm Amadeus, I'm from Indonesia. I created a non-profit organization on traditional biotechnology, Indonesia Temple and we're interested in the J-Labs concept, or if um, the other companies have similar... Goals. No, 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 just that. <laughs> <laughs> J-Labs in Indonesia, you got really it. Great. They're branding. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds uh, a deal, no IP, string attached, and use resource. But uh, how do you make it sustainable business-wise or finance-wise? Mm -hmm. Is it um, a CSR that you just that like you know, like money to contribute to social costs, or you just know the nature of the startup that you will be partner, you will be mentor. Yeah. Sure, that's a great question. Um, so our goal is to make it as sustainable as possible. Now, you're never going to make money off of something like this, and that is definitely not our goal. Um, our goal is to increase the volume, the velocity, and the quality of early stage companies focusing on areas that matter. Um, and so we do have the companies pay for their play, I call it, because everybody takes a different kind of space and a different kind of service, and it's all very objective. Each, is, each of the different types of places you need in the facility or the services have a certain price associated with it. And the reason we do that is because we want the companies to appreciate what it means to be there. You know, most of the time, if you get something for free, you take it for granted, and we don't want that. Um, and so that helps cover some of our costs, uh, a large part of our costs, uh, but it's still an investment on our behalf. And, and our goal is to get that money on the back end by partnering with somebody and, and having a successful win in the marketplace. Um, and when you think about the cost of it, it's peanuts relative to what comes out of it at the end. Um, and so for us, it is, it's a worthy investment, but we also, we go into ecosystems and we get partners to invest alongside of us because we don't want it to be our J-Labs in an ecosystem. We want it to be their J-Labs. So we partner with universities and hospitals and government institutions so that it becomes embedded as a part of the fabric of that community. Um, so everybody owns J-Labs, uh, and, and so for that, um, you know, that also helps us make it a very cost-effective move. Thank you. There was a question in the back of the room there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ann, um, and I work in the medical device industry. Thank you for a great discussion. Um, I believe part of it was around uh, return on investment, and towards the end, you touched on like, the patient impact. I'm just curious to know, uh, in the pharma industry, what are some of the strategies in place to strike a balance between maximizing patient impact and also maximizing return on investment? Thank you. Who wants to take that one? Go ahead. I'll, I'll, if, if it's OK, I'll take that one. Because yeah, I'll, in, I'll, in, I'll, I'll go after you. In, in portfolio management, that's exactly what we do. 
Uh, we have actually a kind of uh, what we call an integrated portfolio framework to evaluate lots of different projects from phase 2B all the way to, to launch. Um, about a third of the overall weighting, it's, it's like a weighted scorecard, about a third of the overall weighting is related to some of the financial metrics, both expected costs, expected value, potential value and return on investment and so on. Um, a third of them are, are kind of qualitative assessment of the, the risks um, involved. Um, but as a, in terms of weighting, the other third is really about the patient impact, the, the potential to transform this standard of care. Um, and uh, strategic implications, for example, in corporate social responsibility. So when you balance the kind of financial side, the overall risk side, and, the, and what we're trying to do in terms of impact, you, we often find that um, you know, projects that um, have a, a good return on investment may be, be um, put lower just because they have less um, patient impact. Uh, for example. So it is important to balance these. When I said the sort of balance the left and right brain between the financials and these more softer indications which are directly linked to patient impact, literally you have to take both of them into account and literally balance them and that's what we do. I take a, a slightly, slightly different point of view there. Uh, I don't think there's a need to balance things because I think the two are not really in a position uh, but the focus clearly needs to be on a patient need. If that patient need is met, and is met with an outstanding therapy, then the return will follow. You won't have to worry about it. There's usually a correlation, if, right? There should be anyway. But, but yeah. if the patient need is unmet, I don't care what the NPV that you started with, it's never going to happen. Yeah. So, so let me add to that, which is, you know, if you look at... So one of the great reasons to work with a big company, whether it's in a no strings attached or later, or even just start conversations, is that we've all invested an incredible amount of money in research to understand where the big unmet needs are. And if you look at our websites and it says what we're interested in investing in, it's because the data has shown us it, it's, there's not enough there yet. So go onto our websites, come talk to anybody on our teams and understand what are we looking for. And then we've kind of got an idea of what the patient need is. And then after that, science first, science first, science first. Follow the science. And if it's really remarkable science, then we'll, we'll go at faith and say, let's follow this through and see what the data tells us along the way. Uh, so in that way, if you're going out to be an entrepreneur, leverage the resources that are out here, the money, the incredible money we've spent to understand where we can make an impact, mm -hmm. and then from there, figure out where you can make a difference. All right, Chris, um, last time I was fortunate enough, fortunate enough to enter the industry, and I worked in the oil gas projects. Um, one of the you know, major things about the oil gas industry is that after the crisis in 2014, where oil prices you know, hit rock bottom, hit the threshold of the barrel, and the entire industry was hurting, we all came together, sat around the table, and devised solutions to try and reduce costs, right? and devised efficiency throughout the entire process, uh, the entire sort of, you know, development of the entire process. Um, very similarly, I feel like the pharmaceutical industry is going through very similar people. Right, we are. We have this huge R&D challenge that needs to be met. Um, you know, today we have Johnson and Johnson, GSK, and Boss all sat around our table. How often do these big players come together, sit around the table, discuss in what ways we can sort of streamline or synergize in terms of deployment? I understand in research, you know, all these companies have their own agendas. We try to sort of differentiate. We need to have their own niches that we want to cultivate and exploit. Um, but in terms of deployment, in terms of marketing, in terms of sales, to what extent do you feel that the so pharmaceutical companies can come together and you know drive me, drive efficiencies in those? So I'll just highlight a, an example that Dr. Stockel showed up on the on his slides called Transcelerate. Um, so there's a huge amount of costs and time and investment that's put into clinical trials. Um, and so the genesis of Transcelerate was to say, how can we create some standardization, some processes, some um, efficiencies for clinical trials across all companies so that the money is being spent instead on 
science and care versus recreating the wheel on all of these things. So that is, a, I think, a great example of how the industry has come together. I think there's more that can be done around that. And it could be expanded on either side of that continuum, um, you know, upstream or downstream. Uh, but I think that that has happened. I think there's ongoing conversations. I think Paul's always in conversations with different folks, whether it's, you know, GSK, Novartis, Gates Foundation, FDA, EMEA. Um, so I think that's, I think there is a wild desire for everybody in the industry to figure out how to make it work better. I don't think we don't think there's an issue or problems. Um, and I think t that we have to come together in pre-competitive ways. Maybe I could just add to that because the analogy with oil and gas is actually incredibly strong. If you think about oil as, a, as an exhaustible resource, finding and exploiting new drug targets is, you know, could be seen in a similar way. But perhaps one of the, the points of optimism there is that whereas we have seen the diminishing returns already in the oil industry through drilling, um, they were able to break through that, break away from that diminishing returns with a, a real technology revolution, fracking. So if we could have the equivalent of fracking um, in the biotech industry, um, that would be, you know, we, we need something like that. We need a real ch shift in mindset, the way we approach and find solutions to uh, improve uh, patient outcomes. Yeah, I mean, She's all I would a fracking lady of the industry. <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to put that in a t-shirt. I, I think one of the great things, actually, about the pharma industry and the, the pharma universe is, is how collaborative it has to be. And, you know, the whole theme of this, particularly on the research side, is, is how many different types of collaboration. But I think, you know, certainly where I've come from, I live in a fairly bipolar world. I mean, I chair a JV with Pfizer and Shionogi, and we all get on like a house on fire. I mean, the concept of GSK can sit around the table with Pfizer very happily. A fantastic collaboration with, with, with J and J as well in HIV. You know, I sat on the JV with Novartis, um, and you know, that's at a very macro level, and then there's lots of stuff that happens at a much more detailed level, whether it's around clinical trial systems or open sourcing. And certainly, I think, where the industry probably doesn't get enough credit in diseases of the developing world, whether it's Zika, whether it's Ebola, whether it's pandemic flu, whether it's TB, we're doing a lot on malaria. I think, as Paul said earlier, if anything, it's really been the industry and the private sector more than the governments that have been the catalyst to try and get the world together to, to do stuff. I mean, the governments have sometimes come in later. Um, but I think the industry often has been the driver and has, has really got down. So, uh, there's an awful lot, and that doesn't mean we don't all compete fiercely against each other as well, but it's perfectly possible to do both. You know, mm -hmm. I love my children, but I don't agree with everything they say all the time. <laughs> Occasionally we have a disagreement. And these, so. these pre-competitive alliances are becoming more and more essential. As we, as we come up against a wall yeah. of increasing fundamental problems, we need to get together to be, have a, develop a common solution. And of course, yeah. once we break through that, we can all... I think culturally, yeah. they're, they're more palatable than they used to be. Yeah. Uh, we're almost uh, out of time, but there was a question there in front uh, uh, that I'd like to uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you for an amazing panel. I have a question that's kind of directed at Dr. Winkle, but can be answered by anybody else as well. How does a company like GenMap plan for the next five, 10, or 30 years from now when your infrastructure is built around one kind of technology? What if antibodies go out of style tomorrow or in five years or 10 years? That is an excellent uh, question, <laughs> and uh, we are definitely going to broaden our uh, technology base. Uh, uh, we are very focused on antibody biology and antibody therapeutics. That is what, what we basically uh, can, can manage really, really well. Uh, we are now making next generation antibody therapeutics, and we are clearly looking at new technology uh, to, to use this, uh, this knowledge, which we build up over, over 20 years, basically, to actually build new uh, platforms. So uh, you will definitely hear uh, from us. We are going to, uh, to move into adjacent uh, fields, uh, and, and we want to do that because, uh, indeed, uh, these, uh, these technologies tend to uh, become obsolete after so many, uh, many years. Right now, we are actually doing fine. There's $85 billion uh, generated by therapeutic antibodies every year. That's going to grow to $135 billion over the coming uh, five years or so. So you're okay in the next five years, I can assure you. Yeah. <laughs> sure. It's talking about R&D productivity. Yeah. And I'd like to know from the, some of you, 
the difference between conceptual research in part that is fundamental research mm. and me too research mm. i'll give you the example the first yep. the first beta blocker programmer yeah that is concept then you get mental prolog and general knowledge yeah. carving the law to me that is me too research yeah the same in say diazepam the first concept then you got a alprazolam midazolam etc like to know how does that correlate with productivity for example and i pfizer 80% of their audit budget is me too research mm -hmm. how much of your research is concept how much of your research is me too that's my question should I start here? 100% of our research is concept right now. It's Don't new. Really it's completely uh, innovative. Uh, what we call is uh, we only work on what we call leapfrog uh, candidate uh, drugs, which are drugs which preclinically are <coughs> jumping over with a hundredfold difference over the gold standards. That's the only ones you want to spend time on. And, and we are not doing any me too or, uh, or me better type uh, technologies at all. I think, Dr. Mead, I mean, it depends on your definition of me too, but the simple thing that has changed is the US payer environment. And these days, uh, I mean, we discussed, the US healthcare system was discussed earlier, but, uh, and it's not without its flaws, but managed care will not pay for something that isn't differentiated. You will be driven down and commoditized. Mm -hmm. And that is a real shift that's happened in the last five years. So we have no choice. I mean, very, very small percentages, I should think, of any of our budgets these days is on is on me too medicine yeah uh, you now, like some to of it's on follow-ons that have a significant benefit i think i think we're out of time uh, i'd just like to point out that uh, as you all saw we've got problems we also have lots of ideas uh, and uh, but eventually uh, we're gonna have to turn it over to you uh, you know that's you know we'll need your help in order to implement and you know supplement what you've got uh, uh, with all the brilliant uh, idea that can germinate in your brain so thanks a lot for your attention for your participation uh, there will be opportunities for question you know uh, when we're done uh, but uh, thanks for a great session